Sounds good. Hey, this is Matt Mulholland. This is the Listen to This Bull Live show. This is the show we get to answer questions for you about anything and everything related to the restoration world. And today we have a special guest, Frank Dalton. Frank Dalton is a book adjuster in Florida, and he's got a lot of information about what it's like being a PA in Florida. And if you wanted to move into Florida as a PA or become a Florida PA, he's got a lot of information for you today on that, um, just as a theme. But if we get off topic, that's cool. You know, it's fine. Normally, I have Remington standing here next to me. He's not next to me. He's at his office. <laughs> hey everybody i wish i was sitting right next to matt right now but um i had a court decide that they want to do a hearing today at 4 30 federal court via zoom so i have been preparing for that all day uh hopefully once an order comes out on our hearing i will be able to actually talk with you guys about it because it's a very interesting topic um, when it comes to property insurance. So hopefully I got my fingers crossed. I think we're going to be uh, successful, but uh, I definitely want to keep you guys up to, up to pace whenever the order does come out. Matt, I'm sorry I'm not there, buddy, but I can tell you this. The attorney that will be there, his name is Nick. He's from the Merlin Law Group. Uh, I've talked with him and uh, sharp guy knows what he's talking about. And I think he's going to do just fine taking my place for today. There he is. Look at him. He's ready to rock and roll. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> you got some competition, Remington. He's, he's yeah. just as good looking. Man, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, but... but <laughs> I love it. But um, yeah, he's going to be able to handle things. And if, if there's things that do come up that Matt, you and I have discussed in the past, that's really kind of down a rabbit hole that I have experience with. I'm, I'm more than happy to shed some light on that next week because I will be right next to you next week. And we're probably going to have a Guinness. So just right. throwing that out there. Well, I'm just going to drink your Guinness today as a result. So uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I am sorry though, guys, but I will be on next week. I just one thing I can't control, and that's when the courts want to have a hearing, and Nick knows all about that as well. Well, enjoy having some quality time with whatever judge it is you're talking to, and uh, we'll miss you. I'll Sounds see you good. Later. See you, Matt. See you, Nick. See you, Olivia. Yeah. How you doing, Nick? Frank, I'm doing all right. how's your day going? Not too bad. How you doing, Frank? Good man, how are you? I was really hoping to see your hat today. Uh, I forgot to bring it to work. Oh, I thought your wife was going to give you the hat, man. I just... I I know what we're talking about. She, so she, she decided to go into the world today gregariously with two of our daughters to the dentist. So, oh no, did she? Did your daughter have a problem, or is this just like a checkup kind of a deal? Uh, I'm going to blame it on the kids, man. Those cavities we would not have allowed. So. <laughs> Cavities are no joke. Nick doesn't have any of those. Look at all those teeth. Matter. Not anymore. No, there was a time. And then uh, all of a sudden you decide, well, it's probably a good idea to brush your teeth. It was a little yeah. expensive. <laughs> so, Frank, I wanted to get a little bit of your background, um, what it is that you've done. You've been a PA in Florida for how long now? I think going on four or five years. Okay. Have you ever been a PA in a different state? Nope. No, always Florida. Have you have you joined FAPIA or done any of those other kinds of organizations there out there? Yeah, I belong to FAPIA. I actually sit on their ambassador board and also their OOPA board. And uh, I think the name of that's changed. But uh, you know, I, I tend to get very involved with stuff and, um, you know, try to reach out and help people. I was on the carrier side for about uh, 15 years prior to switching over to being a PA. Who did you work for? myriad of different companies that I mostly have uh, orders that says that I will not advertise it because it would look like I am trying to um, strictly go after clients from those carriers. So I'll just uh, save that conversation for us on a bar stool someday, but uh, a hand. I'm on a bar stool right now, bud. <laughs> a little jealous. I mean, nobody watches the show, so it's okay. Oh, you stop. You stop. All right. All right. I mean, you can give us some initials or just cough one or two times. If I if I get the initials right, 
you were to happen to cough at that moment, that would be okay, right, Nick? That's no, fine. leave that him would, alone. That would be a breach of contract. <laughs> I, I think as, as we travel down the road of what antics and tactics to use, a lot of people that are in the know will pick up on them. But, uh, and, uh, okay. It does. Yes, okay. I don't know. I'll pull you on here in a heartbeat, Heidi Haskell. Sorry. It's our <laughs> administrator coming in here. Being told the audio might be a little bit bad. Do we know if we've fixed that? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Everybody yeah. sounds good. Right. You, you said you were on what committee with Fabia? Hoopla? I said their ambassador committee. And then also they have, a, I think the name has changed, but it's basically a board that uh, looks at issues with the unlicensed practice of public adjusting. Oh, uh, UPA. UPPA. Say UPA. You know. UPA. Sounds more like it's a sound. job I say it. I, I feel like you might sound like an Oompa Loompa if you say Oompa. I was going with the chocolate factory. Me yeah. Too. <laughs> there you go. The Oompa I mean, the chocolate factory is great. So on that, that's an interesting thing. Um, that probably is going to bring out a whole lot of questions from our audience, to be honest. I didn't know you were on that. That explains why you were talking about that on the Lord's Lost Lounge with uh, Pate the other day. Yeah, a little bit. I'm um, sorry. I keep trying to find my zone in the camera here. Um, I will not be speaking on behalf of Fappy tonight. I sit on those boards. I want to be very clear about that. They take it serious. And oh, that's cool. Them, so. Yeah. I happen to be the president of Gapia, and I'm not talking on their behalf right now either. Nick, who are you not talking on behalf of today? Uh, I'm pretty much just talking on behalf of the people that I work for, but uh, other than that, I have association with anyone else, so I don't yeah. think we have any problem. Cool. Um, up the board. Is there any information in Florida regarding specifically what violates? Hang on a second. I just got the whole. Stop it immediately thing from Olivia. I don't know what she was even going on about. You're messing with the mic and oh, it was very it was? loud. Yeah. All right. Don't mess with the mic, Matt. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've had a lot. Of, you have no idea. Right up to the very limit, I didn't have my camera working. It was crazy. I panicked. I had to change my pants, which is why we were two minutes late. So... Luckily, I keep spare pants in the office for that reason. It's important. I think everybody does that, though, right? Yeah. It's not just me. You got it. When you work from home, you have uh, access to everything. So that's great, too. Oh, that's true. That's true. I'm I jealous. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm jealous there. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, you pick and choose the days you go in when you don't. But um, it is nice, for sure. It's a lot more convenient. And uh, some people say that it's more difficult to get work done. But uh, I don't find that to be the case. It just depends, I suppose, on what your situation is. Yeah, do you have any kids? That is probably the biggest reason why I don't see any difference in my productivity. <laughs> no, no kids. Depending on the age of your kids, man. I've, I've got four, but they could, uh, they could drive you nuts when you're sitting at home because they want to play. Dad's home. Daddy's home. Of course, at some I, point, uh, my wife a long time, and that was definitely I was uh, stored in the coffers of the laundry room. <laughs> you have to have uh, business hours with the kids. You know, I'm, I'm going to be at lunch with you from this time to this time, and if, if we're going to get outside that time, then we're going to have to negotiate me working a little bit other time later on. Okay, kiddos, I, I don't think that they uh, they quite understand. I was on. Um, Oral last night with a condo board and uh, the whole time, you know, I'm explaining to them why the claim is at its current status and it's, it's a long living loss and it's kind of sizey. And my daughter kept coming out demanding snacks. <laughs> <laughs> was it a zoom call? Yeah. Oh yeah. It was perfect case scenario. You know, I'm sitting outside and it's like, you know, 20 degrees out is what it felt. It was probably in the forties, but yeah. you know, sitting out there shivering and you keep hearing the sliding glass door open. I like chips. I I'm sorry, your claim is taking longer because my daughter needs a snack way too often. <laughs> Did it? Uh, it could come across that way, I guess. So, you guys both work in Florida. You work with the uh, Merlin Law Group as a Florida attorney right now. And Frank's been doing Florida for about four years. Uh, we often get asked questions. The reason I wanted to have Frank on here uh, regarding what someone should do if they wanted to be a PA in Florida, but they're a PA somewhere else. That's usually 
who I get those kinds of questions from. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. What is the hardest thing that you guys come across as a public adjuster in Florida or what kind of cases are often difficult to work with in Florida? <laughs> two, two answers to that question. Um, regulatory things in Florida are very different than they are in other states. So I see a lot of people that come in here and they go, hey, can you give me a claim or can you help with this or how do I do this? And oh, I'm a new usher, I'm licensed. And you just bag them. You're like, please log into your DFS webpage, you know, your dashboard, let us see this. They come to find out they're not appointed. There, there's a great example in Florida. I've seen people both sides out practicing, working daily that aren't appointed. And they don't realize that there's all these things that you have to do to keep your li license in, in good standings. And just because you can print a copy of your license doesn't mean you're licensed to practice. So that's a big one for the adjusters on both sides, IAs, staff and PAs. Um, there's also for PAs, there's another little form called a designary primary public adjuster uh, mm -hmm. document. And, and again, you can have a principal license and not be a PA because you don't have that on register. So making sure all the extra $60 add-ons are done and the documents have been submitted properly is huge. Do you find dealing with the Florida, it's not the Department of Insurance there, it's the Department of Finance, right? Department of Financial Services, DFS, yes, sir. Do you find that they work easily with you guys or do they? Do you feel like they might give you a little bit of a hard time? I feel like NT, any entity, there's two heads to it. There's the side that is for licensing and, and then there's the investigation side and they're very dissimilar, uh, both good, not necessarily bad. Um, but uh, the with the licensing stuff, it's really hard to call and get an answer. And then you say, hey, you know, my grandmother always told me to get it in writing. Can you send me an email verifying that I am legal to practice here? And Good luck getting that. So make sure your stuff's in order. Compliance is a it's a little bit of a monster. So, um, so when you're dealing with the uh, answer there, yeah, when you're dealing with the Department of Financial Services, that's DFS. Mm -hmm. Their definition of a CRN. What's a CRN? Civil Remedies Notes. Let me let uh, that to the attorney. Yeah, that's a he had it uh, completely right. It is a civil remedy notice. Um, that, that's what the CRN stands for. So as it pertains to a pre-suit notice and opinions on if a PA sending a CRM violates UPL, unless it's practice of law. Uh, yeah, we definitely, definitely do not recommend that a PA uh, do that. That would be considered the, the practice of law, actually sending a CRN uh, to the DFS, uh, DCO. Um, is a civil remedy notice something that is attached to a claim or pertaining to an insurance claim? Uh, yeah, see, the, the statute is 627. I can't remember the actual numbers. Um, it requires that prior to bringing a bad faith suit in Florida for uh, unfair um, handling practices, et cetera, you have to give the uh, insurance company the opportunity to cure the alleged violation. And uh, in doing so, or the way you do so, is by sending them what's known as the CRN, the Civil Remedy Notice, basically giving them um, notice of what exactly you are alleging um, and giving them the opportunity to cure that. It's a 60 day, day period uh, upon receipt of the CRN. So they have 60 days to cure the violation you're alleging that uh, has occurred. But yeah, that is not something that a public adjuster should, uh, um, should be doing. Have you ever sent one of those in, Frank? No. So I'll springboard right there off of what he's saying. I'm very well disliked for this. Um, I respect my licensing and I respect, and I hold a covenant and I respect an attorney's <laughs> education. I do not think public adjusters should be sending CRNs. I can see it if a claimant or a homeowner were to write their own and send it because they, they could have done enough, you know, WebMD stuff to know what they're saying. <laughs> I don't think it's safe for public adjusters to do it. And quite frankly, uh, the copy and paste of it all, I, in my opinion, Everyone I've ever seen that someone has submitted that doesn't have a Juris Doctorate is is definitely crossing that line. And um, I think it's just one of those theories. You let the butcher do the butchering and the baker do the baking. This is my boy, Pate. He always posts the best questions. That's Look at that. He's in a bow tie in that he picture. He is. He looks good in a bow tie. Yes. Best dressed.
<laughs> he got nominated for best dress. I'm hoping he shows up in some sweatpants and something with a mustard. He's been talking about elastic stuff a lot lately. So yeah. Um, well, that's the section there. He's always coming up with this stuff. Keeps acting like he's works for an attorney or something. Something. Like that. So I mean, let me ask you this, because I'm in other states, there isn't something called a civil remedy notice. There might be a demand for payment or something along those lines. In the state of Georgia, there's a 60 day demand for payment, for example. And we apply that to that language to our proof of loss forms. Um, I know that you're not an attorney in any other states, are you, Nick? No, no. Florida is the only one. OK, so you probably. Uh, I don't know if I ask Remington the next time he's on with us whether or not a 60 day demand meets the same kind of UPL violation if a public adjuster sends that in versus uh, your CRN notice. All right, so pay it again. Can Nick and Frank please provide reasoning on why the line is drawn at there? There. This important and heavily debate. Yes, it is. So, what, yeah, that's a good question. Let me ask you this. I'll ask you a different way. It's tied to a claim, like you said. Mm -hmm. So the civil remedy notice is because the claim hasn't been worked on properly. The public adjuster is hired and often is described as having um, the legal ability to work as a lawyer on a very thin sliver of the law pertaining to insurance policies and claims. If the civil remedy notice is tied to a claim, why wouldn't a public adjuster be allowed to do that? I think they are allowed to. So, I mean, there's nothing that says they can't. I just don't think it's good best practices and I certainly wouldn't recommend doing it. But uh, I have met a, a, a lot of very, very intelligent, very smart public adjusters. I still doesn't, I, I just don't feel that it gives you the right to quote statute in that manner and send a demand to cure for the, uh, for the claim. I know a myriad of people that believe it's a good idea to do. So that way, by the time you get your claim to an attorney, the curing has already started and or expired. But when does it become claims bad faith handling in comparison to claims handling? And I think it's just for me, I guess, you know, if everyone liked red cars, it'd be a really boring drive. I just don't think it's the right thing to do. Right, so, I think you, you jumped on one of the most important issues was uh, when it becomes bad faith with, a lot of those determinations are going to be interpretations of statutes, right? And that would be where you start to cross into what is considered the pra unlawful practice of law whenever you start interpreting statutes and policies and things that, uh, you know, the insurance company is supposed to be doing. Um, and by filing a CRN, you, you are, in essence, interpreting the statute, applying it to your facts, um, each individual claim. And it, there is an argument that, that you are, in, in fact, um, undergoing the practice of law. And I don't, I'm not aware of an absolute prohibition on public adjusters uh, filing a CRN. I know at Merlin Law Group, we would never recommend that a PA do so. Um, so I can't, can't speak to whether it's prohibited, but I do know we, we don't recommend that they take those steps without at least consulting an attorney first. When you send in a civil revenue notice, notice as an attorney, are you getting a contract with the uh, client first before sending that in? Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes we do so. Sometimes we uh, just do it uh, for the benefit of the insured to see exactly how we can get the insurance company to react Insure in terms of prompting them uh, in the claim. Um, so I would say generally yes, but uh, not always. I know we don't so always. It, it doesn't sound like it's required that you have a formal agreement as an attorney in order to send in a civil revenue notice. And if that's the case, then do you really have to be an attorney to do that kind of thing? Maybe yeah, I, I misunderstand what legal advice. You don't have to have a, a, a signed contract to give legal advice, but I think we can all agree that if you are in fact giving legal advice to someone, you are practicing law. So I'm not sure whether that would be what determines whether it's an acceptable thing. But yeah, like I said, I don't know of anything that absolutely prohibits it, but it's, I don't think we would recommend it. And, and here we go. I'll keep my popularity test going. Um, so <laughs> here's what PAs I hear a lot say, oh man, I'll just, uh, I'll tell the client, 
to say this and I'll tell the client to say that. And then they'll tell me to write a CRN and then I'll write the CRN and then the claim will get paid. And yeah, that'll work. That one trick pony rides very well to the next town until an insurance company finally sees a pattern. And you're not going to get, as a public adjuster, you're not going to get 235 consecutive clients that all go, hey, man, no random question for you. Um, could you write a CRN for me today uh, based off of the 90 day payment statute being egregiously offended or ignored? It just doesn't happen. So look at who's driving the vehicle. And if it's the public adjuster that's driving that specific vehicle and then telling the client to do this, that's where I feel that you're getting into an area. Now, flip the coin. If I call up and I go, hey, Nick, I've got a client. I think they might need to speak to you. They've recommended, you know, they've asked me, can I speak to Nick? And I can show you right here in writing. And, you know, I see these indicators. What's your opinion of this? And is this warranted or worthy of a CRM being filed? You know, it's semantics, but nine times out of 10, if you get the real truth, no bull, the real truth of how that CRN got created, you're going to find out that there's a, there's an ism there. An ism? Somebody, somebody telling the client to do something when it wasn't the client's idea. I mean, we, we all practice as public adjusters. We are technically practicing law towards a, we're, we're reading a legal contract. We're trying to interpret that contract and we are telling our clients uh, what our opinion is on that and advising them in a very real way. Now, it's it's specific to an insurance claim. And so there is a sliver of the law that's cut out for public right. adjusters. So if, if I, I feel like if the CRN is there and it is tied to that claim, then it makes sense that a public adjuster should be able to do something with that until there is a court of record that probably says that you can't. I'm sure there's always going to be PAs that are pushing that. Now, having said all that, there are things that are legal in the state of Georgia that I often tell public adjusters not to do just because it's a bad idea. Um, it is legal in the state of Georgia to be a contractor and a public adjuster on the same claim at the same time. But there is an obvious conflict of interest there and it really pisses the adjusters off. So it's just not a good practice. So I tell just, them, don't do it. Back around, it, it, I don't think Nick or myself is professing that it's not legal. I just, I yeah. think when you look no, at it- I don't as think a you guys practice. have said that, so. But uh, yeah. I tell you, and John's got a good one there, and then that leads me to one that I'll actually throw out there after you finish that. But yeah, I mean, if you write a CRN, it doesn't mean I'm not gonna say, hey, how are you when we cross in the street? It's just something that I, wouldn't allow any of my staff to do. All right, back to pay it again. If I'm correct, CRN is intended for use by parties who are beginning the process of filing suit against an insurer. One, could the CRN set a preemptive cap on the claim by not taking into account entire damage model? Mm -hmm. Let's just stop there and answer that one real quick. You know, set a preemptive cap on the claim, but not taking that. Um, well, see, the thing is the CRN, there is no requirement that you provide the actual damage amount to cure the alleged violation. So you don't have to put in the CRN any amount that you're requesting. Uh, you just have to allege what exactly the insurer has violated in terms of the, the statute and uh, give them the opportunity or at least the notice to, to cure that violation. So in terms of capping the uh, the damages, I'm not sure. I may be in misinterpreting the question, but there, there is no issue with capping the damages. Could the CRN set a preemptive cap on the claim by not taking into account the entire damage model? I would assume that if you put in a CRN before the work has begun, then there might be some things that are uncovered during the work uh, having been performed. Maybe there's some damages that were unknown at the time. Are you eliminating the ability to collect other funds later on should additional information come forth? Sure. Unforeseen additional living expense, found damage to possessions, contents. Yeah, I mean. Does a CRN create a situation where there is a release that is created? I mean. Normally when you file a CRN before it cures, they're looking to resolve it with a release so they prevent litigation. So if that is the case, there would be a cap there. That's that exactly would happen. All right. Well, second part of the question, could this cap be potentially deleterious? Olivia's going to look that up for me. 
deleterious, delete, eerious, deletes of ears. You can't hear anything. That's what I think it means. Is it Latin? I think it, I have no idea. Deleterious to the final damage model, potential damage model. Would this potentially against best interests of the insured? My initial reaction is if there is a cap created because the CRN is applied prior to the work being performed, then it might not necessarily be in the best interest of the insured. I guess I'm not understanding the, the question fully because uh, the, the CRN the word they use. is a prerequisite to a bad faith cause of action. So um, any damages that uh, or, you know, anything that's uncovered say after the cure period, the insurance company would still be required to uh, indemnify for those damages if they're found to be covered under the policy. So you're just, you're just um, overcoming the, the, the cure is just to prevent the ultimate bad faith claim that would arise if the cure period, if, if there's no cure during that period. Oh, I Positive, sorry, I know what deleterious means. Deleterious. It <laughs> means <laughs> causing harm or damage. A divorce is assumed to have a deleterious effect on children. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Learned a new word for the day. Um, hey, from Alabama too. That's the crazy part. He's, I tell he's you another word that I would love to get Nick's backup or opinion on before we move past the bad faith and da 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 da. Is uh, when do you feel a PA can be attached to bad faith in the state of Florida? Ooh, that's a really good question. Thanks. When a PA can I, can you expand? Yeah. <laughs> So if you have a bad faith suit going forth with a client, when, and I, this isn't a trick answer, I've had multiple opinions. When can a PA be attached to that bad faith on a percentage? Meaning when can the PA's fees get paid as a result of the bad faith? I've, I've been told that as long as the insured attempted to go it alone and was forced to hire the PA, then at that point, the PA can be attached to bad faith claims. I told you when we started this, I wasn't going to try to answer things that I don't know. And, uh, well, that'll be a fun one. We can pick up. I'm not sure we'll get hundred answers on it. Right? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt. What a trick question, man! I got a lot of different answers, but it's a good one to put in the thinking pot. Matt's eyebrows went up. So we'll that's... write it down for Remington. Yeah. <laughs> They're at least an inch higher than usual right now. I really want to know that answer too. And and for just about every state, um, there is a fee shift ability in Florida mm -hmm. if. There is a, an in, even one single dollar that is added after a um, a suit is filed, then the attorney's fees get paid in Florida, correct? Is that how that works? One penny. One penny, not even a dollar. What if it's a half a cent? I believe that's still fractional. Yeah. So I think <laughs> everyone goes to jail then for breaking the penny in half. Yeah. So if so, if there is that fee shift, meaning that the attorney's fees then are no longer owed by the insured, they are owed by the aggrieving party, um, then any I, fees associated with that case should be included if you're using the public adjuster's information and their work product in order to win the case, then it, that could be attached. I know that there are expert fees that could be paid. Mm -hmm if they're used in order to prove the loss. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a good question, Frank. I believe that you're hunting down the road of the truth of that. And then um, where it stands, I mean, I'm sure there's people that have done it and, and gone forward and uh, all that good jazz. So Mike Bowman is a PA that works in Florida. He says, when you put it in your contract, I think that, that pertains to I think, I think in Mike's defense, I think you do have to put in your contract that you have the intent to attach to bad faith, but there still are some thresholds. Like if you just signed a client from day one and proceed forward, it being in your contract, I don't believe will allow it. I, I think that the client would have had, but I could be wrong. I mean, well, he definitely has the overall theme or point, which is the contract is going to determine everything that we're talking about. So reviewing that would, would obviously give you your answer. But like I said, I'm, can't I can't I can't speak to it. It's a it's a sticky question right now for sure. Hey, well, I'm going to immediately start changing every contract that I have for every state that immediately is going to say uh, if I can get the insurance carrier to pay my fees during a lawsuit, then by golly, 
I'm going to use those terms. By golly, I'm going to get them from the insurance company. There you, you go. think that would fly? Just, just quote the movie. I'm going to get you sucker, but I want to get my money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's so that fee shift in Florida provides you guys with a ton of leverage. I think uh, there are states that don't have any kind of a fee shift where the attorney's fees don't get paid. But if that fee shift is there, do you think that you are more apt to get an attorney involved in the state of Florida than you probably would if you were in a state that didn't have a fee shift? Not for our firm, but I can see how that temptation is there for people. Uh, how many people are in your firm, Frank? Uh, our total entity, I believe 58. No kidding. I kid you not. How many are PAs? About half of that, 22, 25, something like that. Wow. That's a pretty big firm. Thank you. Well, I mean, that was a fact. That's, is that considered big in Florida? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't I, you know what? I don't watch my competition and, um, and if I see them, I applaud them. Um, I know, uh, I think five stars, a pretty good size firm here. And, uh, the owner was up here a few weeks ago at one of our events and, you know, it's, Hey guys, how are you doing? I don't, everyone always thinks you're going to be in the street with six guns shooting at each other and stuff. I, I think uh, if I were to buy a gas station, I wouldn't want to own one on an isolated corner. I'd want to buy a lot where three other gas stations were on other corners and put mine on the fourth. So uh, misery loves company. Competition sets numbers. It's a good thing. There's a lot of very good PA firms in Florida and um, size wise, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. If um, we, we live in a state where there's very few public adjusters, I think in the last time I looked, there's, less than 400 public adjusters that are registered in the state of Georgia, mm -hmm. um, which is very few. You guys are in a state where there's thousands. Do you find yourself directly competing against other public adjusters a lot? Every blue moon. And when it pops up, I always remind my guys, Hey, you know, uh, like in an uh, up counsel relationship with the law firm, you know, why don't you reach out to the other PA and see if they want to work it with you? Really? Yeah. Have you ever gotten a attorney contract signed at the same time as your public adjuster contract? Hell no. <laughs> it was worth asking. I'm going to say that I did have a client call me and say, hey, I called another PA firm first. His contract's here. And I'm like, oh, I don't really want to see it. When I went over there, I looked down and it is it was literally a law firm's contract. I'm like, wow. You know, no. Have you ever know. lost business to an attorney? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think maybe once a client called and said, hey, my cousin-in-law's sister's brother is a, um, you know, an attorney in the other side of Florida. And they said they'll take my claim, uh, claim, claim case for them. And I said, no problem. When they get stuck, tell them to give me a buzz. I'll help them out. If you don't practice first party and you're a lawyer, man, I don't recommend switching over. It's Nick could probably speak volumes of this. It's a very rarefied field. If you keep a claim on uh, 90 days at the same time, is it time to go to? I mean, Mike, I think we're singing from the same sheet of music. I mean, that's one of my uh, litigated referral index things. There's a myriad of things that go into it. But after 90 days, uh, unless there was some like ROR or reservation of rights or an egregious way to delay it out a little bit, 90 days is getting pretty old without direction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's that's different for Florida versus other states. And maybe it's not different for other states that have a fee shift as well. But for a state that doesn't have um, good bad faith laws or, or any way for the attorney fees to get paid outside of just a traditional tort, going to an attorney after 90 days could put the insured in a pickle. They might still have to pay the attorney's fees, even if they win, even if they're able to settle. And if that's the case, do they still have enough money to make repairs? Uh, so we'll, we'll tend to hang on to a claim for a long time. We'll go for, for most claims in, in the state of Georgia, there is a two year uh, suit limitation period built into the policy. So we'll go all the way up to about a year and a half, give an attorney time to get everything together, send in a 60 day demand and file suit. Um, we'll go as, as far as we need to and we push really hard but if we don't we know that the attorney's fees aren't likely to get paid it's 
such a ridiculously low percentage of claims that go to litigation that end up having attorney's fees paid that it's not worth it. It's not in the benefit of the insured. That seems very, very different. If you apply this rule that Mike just wrote to your claims as well, I got to tell you, that's that's a very different story than than half of the country. Yeah, I think this rule that Mike's putting in there is probably like anything. It's it's a guideline yeah. and it's a safe indicator. You know, my brain immediately jumps to what Mike's really said was if you have a claim that's super stagnant with no motion, no this. So I'm reading into it a little bit, but it, yeah. it, is, it is a good indicating threshold. So we do we do litigated referral reviews it's 60 90 and 120 days and then from there they're set by managers and the reason being is if we have like some weird engineering double up or something it's yeah cool 120 days go 200 days go a year i have one right now that it's about a year plus but there's reason for it um in in a just a stagnant scenario then you know, in Florida, they've been hitting around the past few years about putting on the bills about dispatch and diligence. And um, I kind of jokingly say it's like a condominium board. It's a for profit corporation where everyone gets together and they run for a chair because they don't like Margaret and the color of Margaret's doormat. And they don't read the laws and understand that it's still a for profit corporation or organization. And it's the same thing with public adjusting. There's rules and there's administrative codes and uniform codes and you got to keep up on it. But dispatch indulgence, I digress, is becoming a big one. And if we go to the insurance company and we go, oh, those sons of Jones, they didn't respond to our letter for 14 days. And then we sent them this and they didn't respond. for the, Everyone wants to hold their feet to the fire. But then no one on this side is going, wait a minute, I, I haven't sent an email in 27 days. Like, you know, so if you get these long areas of latent, just stagnant area, I saw Matt's eyes go over there. <laughs> I'm running off subject here. They become an issue. So I think if there's a lot of stagnant time on the file and there's not a reason it needs to be addressed. You just happen to say the exact word that Mike had just posted. There you go. Stagnant Probably. if you were here. I read it and I'm thinking at the same time. So oh, yeah. okay. I didn't even know you guys could see those on your end, to be honest. I had no idea. Uh, I got a question earlier today. Um, I always seem to get whenever there's a new attorney that's going to be on, and, and that was simple. So, Nick, when you are looking at uh, cases, do you believe that it's better to get a case from a that has a public adjuster involved or a case that doesn't? Uh, I mean, obviously, that would depend on a lot of the circumstances, but I tend to lean toward I do enjoy I do prefer when there's a public adjuster, at least someone who is very organized and methodical in their approach and adjusting a claim. Um, I mean, you do get different files and uh, different PAs have different methods. But when you get a PA file that, is, like I say, is organized, there's a methodical approach to how they put together the file. It does make it, not just reviewing whether it's you know a meritorious claim easier, just the entire process. Like if you, if you decide to go forward with a lawsuit and um, uh, per, you know go per, pursue the claim, sorry, um, having that organized PA file just makes the entire process that much more um, efficient. So I would lean toward yeah. I, if I'm going to get a new claim, it is much. Uh, it's typically much more efficient to have already had a PA put the groundwork in. And then there were a resource uh, from then on out in terms of uh, how the case progresses. So that's, I would answer yes. I would prefer to have a PA who's already worked on the file. Would you prefer to have a PA that's worked the file for a year and has really left no stone unturned or a file that has recently gone stagnant at 90 days and is handed off to you guys? Do you think that there's a more work involved in the first claim or in the second claim scenario? Well, yeah, uh, the, the circumstances surrounding why there was every stone was unturned and yet there still is no progress because, you know, PAs do attempt to um, expedite claims as quickly as possible and in, uh, in the for the benefit of the insured. So if every stone has been unturned and they've been, uh, you know, advocating persistently for the, that entire year, there's probably a reason why they haven't come uh, been able to um, come to an agreement. Uh, it, it, on the flip side, the 90 days stagnant, uh, there, you, you, there's, there's so much unknown when you're initially reviewing the file. Um, I would still typically, if you're going to tell me that I have a PA that has extremely organized and methodical file, I'm still going to lean that way. 
because of the unknown with the 90 days stagnant. And that's the main reason why uh, it's being referred. And, and real quick too, to kind of jump on the back of that, like with ours, at the end of 90 days, we will have either submitted for requested or exhausted alternative dispute resolution by 90 days. So we've already had a failed mediation or an appraisal demand that was rejected reject it for, you know, not because oh, non disinterested or whatever, like, oh, no, we just won't accept it because every policy is a little different. But in 90 days, if we haven't had a mediation, it's been submitted for scheduled or requested by the client. You're able to put an entire file together in 90 days and go through mediation and file a Appraisal man, well, you have 54 people. I just answered my own question. That's because you have 54. You just hired me, someone. Yeah, you have a lot of people to work that stuff. All right, paid again. Paid's on top of it. In many states, I think PAs have to cost benefit time on wearing out the insured. In states like Georgia, I think the idea of going to attorney when the claim stalls out and you have made a multiple two or more attempts to get the carrier to understand the position, these attempts should be separated by reasonable time. Mm -hmm. I think that whatever reasonable time is, is, is dictated by the specifics of that state and what things, how 14 things days, I think in Florida. Yeah. Reasonable time in Florida is definitely going to be very different uh, because it might be in the best interest of the insured to move to an attorney a lot faster. And that's, that's a clearly a very different scenario than most other states. Any states that have a fee shift, I believe going to an attorney earlier on can benefit the insured. How long do cases usually take in Florida, though? We're talking with the mortgage company involved. <laughs> <laughs> Five years. No. Um, do they? I hope no, that's the mortgage companies here are pretty rough. Um, and then the downside is, is if you do a release, the mortgage companies act as if they've never heard of that before and keep regressing the adjuster's uh, worksheet. And boy, oh boy, that that's a monster ball of its own. But uh I don't know. I mean, you know, if three people come in tomorrow, not every file at our firm is 90 days, but in 90 days, there's a way to be hanging around. We need we need to change a trajectory or something. Um, but I would say on average, like if we're talking about residential claims, 50, 80,000 less, you know, they're 90 days, 120 days tops. Really? right in there i mean but i don't think that's anything i'm doing or my firm's doing that's just a standard down here is that uh, true that's that's just normal in florida why aren't we working in florida olivia come on down we got plenty of room i think a lot of it too matthew is was your initial ask forty-five thousand, and the carrier was 36 and you settle it whatever 42 or were you initially asking 93 and the carrier was 12 and all the contractor peer estimates come in at 17. That's going to really dictate the time on file. I mean, most of our files are settling in the 80 to 90% of our initial request. Mm -hmm. So we try most to of our claims. Um, it's the argument is on coverage. It's not on uh, negotiation. And once we get to the negotiation phase, they, that, that's a very makes sense. Getting the coverage, uh, applied is the hard part here um and, and in many other states too not just not just georgia you know no, I, I, I see it we're talking about florida today but we do work outside of florida and i i am picking up what you're putting down but yeah i mean getting to that coverage is is uh honestly that's that's my part of the job once we get coverage it moves on to a desk adjuster to negotiate and we, sure. we have a handful of them so there's there's a very different work set for getting to the point where you have coverage extended, mm -hmm. which is getting to uh, negotiate dollars. But no, I get the point. But we don't have the weather events that they do in Florida. That's true. And we don't get rained out and snowed out. You know, like I, a lot of states where stuff just gets delayed two weeks because of inclement weather or, you know, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Man, my attorney wait after we send an attorney a claim once we get the no, I feel that they CRN, if applicable, should file and the suit filed. I probably should have read that before posting that up there. I have no idea what that says. Why would an attorney wait after we send an attorney a claim? Do you ever sit on a claim after it's sent to you, Nick? 
Uh, we try not to. Um, I, I guess that would all be, you know, strategic decisions, but I can't imagine why uh, you get referred a claim and it would be in the best interest of the insured to sit on the claim. Um, Is there any scenario you can come up in your head where sitting on the claim after it's sent to you makes sense? Well, you know, you don't always file the CRN immediately. Sometimes you file the complaint and then, uh, although it's, you know, general practice is a lot of people file the complaint the CRN at the same time. Um, now, I, I, I'm trying to think of a reason why you would delay doing either, but... Uh, I'm sure a reason exists in the world. But yeah, you know, it's it's all all I'm trying I to get all creative. We're still waiting on an answer from, from the state. So the state of Florida says if there's a declared state of emergency, your fees are reduced to 10%, which we're all familiar with. Well, I think it was one of the recent hurricanes. They only declared a state of emergency in four counties. And I have clients on the opposite side of the state that are filing claims and we can't get clarity from the state on if that statute covers the whole state. And you would immediately think your knee jerk would be, no, 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 it's just the county, but that's not the way the statute reads. So we, we still have not gotten an answer on that from the state. After in terms of in a civil remedy notice, does that usually fix or finish the claim off or do you still end up filing suit most of the time? Uh, can you can you repeat the first part? Did you ask uh, if you if they do cure the CRN, that's the end of it? Is that the question? And once you send one in, how often do they just pay off of that or do you end up with uh, a suit filed? Uh, yeah, it depends on why the uh, the claim wasn't paid in the first pet in the first place. If it's uh, you know a coverage dispute or um, uh, an evaluation dispute, th th there can be differences in terms of whether they are willing to uh, attempt to cure the the violation. Um, I would say, on in most cases, no, they don't typically just pay the uh, amount to cure. Um, but in terms of Mike's question, the, the only other thing I could think of, of why you would send on a claim is um, during the review process, you don't feel comfortable filing a CRN or a complaint until you have, you know, sufficient facts that would support doing so. Um, I, I think he's operating under the assumption and asking the question that, the, you know, all the facts and things have been provided. In that case, uh, once again, uh, I can't really come up with anything, but in terms of one, one, one situation where they might is uh, when the facts don't satisfy what you need in order to do so. It's not very often that I'm satisfied by facts. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that was mostly for a living. <clears throat> Wearing out the insured is an issue because it plays into delay, deny, defend. I think as a PA, it's important to gauge temp of the client by communication. I agree with that 100%. Sometimes it's best to have that talk quicker and discuss file goals. That's a good point. Uh, I, had a, I had a client recently give up on, and honestly, it, it, uh, I was pretty despondent about it. I, I was pretty upset because it was a file that I personally was handling. And although the carrier was very, it was a lot of bad faith involved, very clear bad faith. So if he had decided that he was comfortable getting an attorney involved, it would have been a great case, um, but he didn't have it in him to continue. And it was a fire and fires are always seem to be that way. So if, if you have a client, if you have a claim, it's a good idea to see where your insured is, to see where it is, you, how far you want to push this, um, because your, your insured can get worn out, especially if it goes as long as it does in states like mine. You know, getting an attorney involved at 90 days does sound like amazing. And in states where that is viable, that's something that we pursue often as well but only if it's in the best interest of the insured. But Florida seems to be one of those states that it could be because the attorney's fees are gonna get paid if there's a fraction of a penny increased on that claim. I think that's pretty cool. So if, yeah. you're, a, if you're a PA in a different state and you wanna to move to being a PA in Florida, what do you think you should do? Get a moving truck. At, no, 
that's it. Just do it. There's really nothing stopping you. No, I mean, there's a million scenarios that work out. I mean, the, the thing I run across the most is like a lot of guys that are new to the state and even some that practice here are like, oh, it's been 90 days and they owe us by law. And like, mm, no, just says that they have to have a claims determination. They can no longer deny the claim unless they reserve their rights properly. And uh, now they just owe interest when they do make a payment. We can't send the police there to arrest them. You know, so they can still disagree with the amount of loss. They just have to be able to tell you within that time frame whether or not there is coverage. They have 90 days to either deny or pay the claim or give a good, ample reason via reservation of rights to extend the investigation period. How long can they extend it beyond 90 days? I believe indefinitely. <laughs> really? They'd have to have a darn good reason. But yeah, I mean, if every time their engineer came out, you said, no, this is a green wall and three other people said it's blue and you keep triggering it. You give them ample reason and you, you know, you get in that habit of writing these emails that look like this to be mean to them instead of just saying, Hey, can I get a claim status? You know, I had one recently that someone wrote in and it was something you would say is trivial. It was something like, you know, a dispute of coverage or something. It just it triggered the whole thing. And it's like, sometimes less is more, you know, just ask the question you want to ask directly. So, So if I've got a claim right now that if they want to send an engineer out, and we're on nine months after the data loss, they've sent an engineer out. They sent a building consultant out. Mm -hmm. The building consultant was on site at this property for seven days straight doing something. I wasn't there the whole time. I, I have no idea what they were doing, but when we go back out on site tomorrow night there, we're going to get to see all their little stickers and, and spray paint everywhere. It's, it's a fairly large complex, but seven days is ridiculous. And now they're sending somebody else out again. And we've already scheduled our next appointment two weeks from now to do some other things. It, it makes no sense. In certain states, there isn't any time frame set for how long they have to investigate and how long they have to determine if there is coverage or not. But if they say that they are providing coverage in Florida, that doesn't mean that their investigation is over. That just means that they've agreed that they are liable for whatever the damage is, but they can still continue to investigate what the extent of the damage is, what the amount of loss is. So I'm sure a million people can chime in and say, oh, you're getting this wrong. But I believe as long as they make an undisputed payment and they extend coverage, there, there's, there's nothing clean that writes that says they can't continue to investigate how much they owe. It's just, do you owe the claim or not? So yeah, the undisputed payment's very key. Yeah. The time that they can arrange. Is there a limit on the amount of time that an opposing appraiser can drag out appraisal? Appraisal's not regulated. Appraisal? Yeah, we do a ton of it. We probably have a couple hundred open appraisals right now. Um, you know, there's one law book that we all refer to with appraisal, but it's not regulated. So you can't really regulate an unregulated industry. Um, I think there's verbiage about how long they have to name an appraiser, but that's, I believe, the end of the rules for that. I mean, we get them all the time where they're like, oh, well, I got to call the desk examiner and see if they'll let me pay this. Like, that's so egregiously offensive to this product. But, you know, I think that's an issue in every state. And, you know, the, the question becomes whether or not that period of time um, is tolling. You know, will that apply towards the suit limitation period? Yeah. Nick would be able to answer this a little bit better. For, and for the state of Florida, do you know if there's any rulings that go down that path? If the appraisal lasts four years and you've passed the suit limitation period or the statute of limitations, or whatever it is, it's in Florida. Uh, would that time frame from the appraisal be able to be thrown out? Uh, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I do know uh, we have a blog. It's called Merlin Law Group blog. It's a uh, first party property advocates um, center. That's all we do. And I'm sure if you went and Googled that, that's that the thing that pop up. I mean, that's a, that's a, such a big topic that uh, it's almost invariable that somebody has written on it on whether the tolling, uh, whether the, the time at which uh, appraisal is, is conducted tolls the, uh, the, the limitations period. I use that blog all the time to avoid um, 
UPL, Unlicensed Practice of Law. I just say, well, I found this online. It, it's a Merlin Law blog, and it talks about this particular issue. That's their opinion, not mine. Yeah, uh, that's that's clearly, it's a shot across the bow. You know what I mean? This is this is illegal what you're doing, and here's here's evidence. <laughs> Bad faith seems to be more of a concept than a reality. Our bad faith law has no teeth because it requires evaluation due to the bifurcated process. The insurance knows they can hold that money until the day before trial and pay a settlement that the client will agree to. I think it, first off, it's coming to me who Mike is and he's, he's a sharp guy. I follow him on Facebook, I believe. And, uh, I think that that's we're talking ninja level. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I know he's a smart cat, but um, you know, I think a lot of it just depends on you know if you if you go back to the layman's version of this. If you're asking for thirty grand and they say it's twenty, and the client can be made whole at thirty grand less their AOP deductible, you don't seem to have. And I'm not implying Mike doesn't do that, but I, I just saying when they seem to be legitimized amicable resolves in our region, at least, cause I have heard some stuff different in the panhandle and definitely in South Florida where I used to work. Um, I just, we just don't see it that much. I see them do stuff every day that makes me say, can you believe what they did? I can't believe that they did this blah, blah, blah. But the reality is if, if you're, if you're hearing, that adjuster, that desk examiner go, are you sure you're a PA? This looks like one of our estimates. They tend to pay them relatively quickly. Well, let me ask you this. If, if you're likely to get the attorney's fees paid with the bad faith, but you have to go all the way to trial to get that, do they often offer the attorney's fees in settlement? Or is the settlement considered an additional penny or dollar amounts more? And so the attorney's fees are paid automatically then? That's so loaded there, Matt. And there's about three things in that. First off, with the new AOB laws, and we don't work with many AOB contractors, it's not just one penny. There's a percentage, there's a scale. Mm -hmm. but if we're just talking about clients and first party, we have, I, th I think, 100% of our claims that we have referred to attorneys have settled. They didn't go to trial. If it's or 99 point something and the attorney still can re request the fees be paid under the first party statute provision. I get attorneys every day of the week telling me that's not possible. It is. And and Nick's nodding his head. So we, we have one the other day we gave to an attorney four weeks ago. He has already settled it. Unencumbered fees to him. Payments to the client and payments to us. All separate checks. All first party. So it, I think a lot of it depends on how the case is prepared if all forms of alternative dispute resolution have been exhausted prior to going to litigation. So that there's not one answer that fits that shoe box there. Right. Yeah. No, that's what I will say is there's definitely not one answer in terms of the, uh, um, the results uh, in the, the fee statute and how it applies to those types of settlements. Um, like, like you said, it, it depends on the circumstances, but um, yeah, I, I can't, the whether you're entitled to the fees is like, like very dependent on how you approach the, the settlement negotiations. And I'll just finish it with. Yeah, it's, it's very circumstantial for each individual case. So is it is it something that is an agreement made between opposing counsel and you or is this something that the Florida statute requires that they pay if it's a settlement? That if it's in the settlement agreement itself, that would be why, you know, the uh, the settlement agreement would 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 control. Okay. I assume they're doing it prophylactically, knowing that the fees would be encumbered eventually, anyways. But that's just an assumption, right? I think that I think that's the way to look at it. Did if you the that. prophylactically, like, did, is, is it, that what you said? Yeah, it's safety, a measure of safety, no different than a prophylactic. Do something preventing <laughs> it from happening. If that's a real term. That's I, I, it's from the medical industry and the prophylactic uh, that is used about ninety nine percent of the time does not apply to what your brain goes to. Yeah. They make <laughs> fantastic balloons, also. Nick and Frank, if you want to be a PA in South Florida, do you need to live in Fort Lauderdale and be super jacked and tan and drive some former brightly colored exotic car? Preferably, like uh, Maserati is like the Honda Accord of Fort Lauderdale. There you go, Matt. That's why we're not in Florida. You can't get jacked and tan. I can't. It's impossible. I can't. That's, I can't. That's it. 
the Irish DNA in me, this is as tan as I get, so I don't fit. Yeah. I mean, he's there. He's Irish. I could do it. I could do it. Matt doesn't get tan. He gets red. Yeah. I don't think DFS requires it, but it no, no, they actually do. Do you have to have a jacked up truck? I mean, does it have to be on a lift? That's everything. It's squatted. That's everything north of Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Highly recommended. The front part mm -hmm. has to be lifted. The back oh, stays please low. Don't. Please don't. <laughs> oh, that, that's very different. In Georgia, it's called no, squatted. Uh, roofers aren't required to be licensed, but they are required to have at least three inch lift on their truck. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's true. Minimum. Minimum. So, what about? Do you guys ever hear with people coming to Florida? Like, do they, do they understand? When the 10% fees kill off and when they kick in, good night, Joe. Have a great one. You know, that's one I see a lot of new people to the area. They kind of miss on. It's a full year after the declared state of emergency unless the governor extends it, which they have before. So look, from what I understand, it's, it's only in declared emergencies situations. But what if the first offer has already been made by the carrier? Can your rates increase? No. Nope, but a lot of people do it. Yeah, so that's what I'm told often from others is, is it can go up to 20% if the first offer has been made and you're only collecting on the increase. Put that in writing. Huh? Promise you it comes back. No, but. Hmm. So it's 10% no matter what, if it's a declared emergency. Outside of a declared emergency, is there a cap? 20%. For one year. Yeah, one year, but the governor can't extend it. And they have, there was some confusion during, I think it was uh, Michael about the exact date of landfall and when it went out of the state. So it got extended like a week and a half. <clears throat> I, I can attest to this guy's truck. It is jacked. And he wears loafers in them constantly. He's a loafer guy. It's so, it's so incongruous to, in Congress, it, I'm saying it wrong, probably, to wear loafers and to have a jacked up truck at the same time, right? It just seems weird, right? Well, right? I don't know. So are we talking about a Saturday or a Monday? <laughs> All right, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah, I bet you love your loafers. So the fees can go up. If it's not a declared emergency, is there a cap at 20%? <laughs> yep. 20% global and not a penny more. Okay. Hmm. So there are people that I've seen that charge 20% and then $250 for their estimates. And so then you there can are, add, no, you you add experts fees on top of that and any additional costs. Well, there better be a damn warranted reason and you can't just do it to increase costs or say, I want to use an expert on every file, you know, but the expert fees wouldn't necessarily, if you're just covering the cost of the expert fee up front and just you can't loan back, a client money. do what? You can't loan a client money. So that's a sticky area. And I see people doing that and they say, oh, well, I'll pay for the expert and you can get me back when you settle. But there's other stuff in the same statute that says you can't advance the client money and you essentially are advancing the money if you do that. That's literally in the statute. Well, uniform code or statute, please. I, I don't want to be quoted and have stones thrown at me, but I can find it and send it to you. But yes, you cannot advance a client money. This is and why we have an attorney on these things. Nick, can you advance a client money to pay for no. an engineer? Can a PA? No, I'm going to say no, but no. Can a no. PA pay for the appraisal? No, uh, PAs, I'm going to take Frank's word and say, probably not. No. Mellon, what are huh. these percentages? That's something that's not in the Georgia statutes at all. It's definitely not in the Tennessee or North Carolina that I'm aware of. You also can't charge on deductible or non-recoverable depreciation or charge in advance on recoverable depreciation. There's a lot of states with that kind of a statute. It's it's on whatever uh, funds you're able to recover for the insured. Um, so that, that one I get. Uh, not being able to pay for certain things definitely would be state specific. So loaning or claim money, I, I suppose you would be loaning it money if you are paying for the fees of a expert. I never thought of it that way though. Makes sense. What about a, what if? I assure you I didn't until there was a reason I had to think about it that way. Hmm. <laughs> Same now, genesis until it's not. 
Yeah, it's a, I think there's a difference between an advancement and uh, like the, the, the term that gets thrown around, which is loan. Um, like for instance, we tend to advance some court costs and things like that, like that's in the contract. But in terms of uh, whether you can actually pay the fee as a public adjuster, the, like the expert's fee for doing things, uh, I think uh, I'll have to defer to Frank on whether that's something that's uh, an appropriate thing to do. I, I, I don't know. I, I would imagine not. So here's a scenario you get a lot. A plumber shows up to a house and he says, I need to go ahead and cut open the slab, do this and do that. I need $800 today or I can't do anything and I can't say there's a leak. And then you look at the client, you go, Mrs. Ross, do you have $800 to play the plumber? And she goes, no, I, I can't do it. Then never mind. I don't even want to file a claim. So now not only are you advancing the client money, but you're also doing something to them financially to incentivize them to file a claim. And that becomes very dangerous and it's done frequently. Because if you pay that eight hundred dollars up front, then you're encouraging them to file a claim. No, if the client says, "I can't afford to pay the plumber," never mind. I don't want to file the claim, which happens a lot. You know, some people don't have an extra thousand dollars sure. going around, and then you say, "Well, I'll pay the plumber bill," and he can go ahead and expose it, and then you can file your claim. Now you're financially you're giving them something to file a claim. What if you had a separate contract for that loan? Just make sure the interest rate's good. I mean, would that would that suddenly make it legal? Is the question. I mean, if, if it's if it's not something that you're doing as a part of your public adjuster contract, does the statute in Florida even pertain to it? Can it even apply? If you financially benefit as a PA by them filing the claim, again, this is running down the road of semantics on a single subject. But I think you could what if your way around it. But I'm just saying that if someone's coming to Florida and they're going to start practicing. Don't pay the plumber bill for the client. Don't pay the MS bill for the client. You know, it's just not good practice. And so know. any expenses you could take it also on as a public adjuster, you should just expect that that's going to be coming out of your fees. So if you pay the plumber's cost and that's just part of your fees, do you think that's OK? I don't. I think you're still enticing the person to file a claim by paying their fees. What if they've already filed a claim? Then that's different. Is it? What do you think, Nick? No, that would change the situation pretty drastically because I think the, the main issue you're trying to avoid is what he was saying, which is enticing or giving the insured the reason to file the claim, which, as he was saying, could, could get you into some trouble um, in terms of, you know, it, it was your actions that prompted the insured to find the, file the claim and you're doing so for your own financial benefit. That's sort of where you're getting at with those issues. So if you have already filed the claim, and the appraisal provision requires that the appraiser get paid from the insured and the public adjuster then pays the appraiser's fees up front for the insured. Is that okay because the claim is already filed? That's the line I wouldn't walk on. <laughs> Does it have anything pertaining to the caps? Are they saying that they don't want you to do that because in a state of emergency it's 10% or their cap is at 20. So by taking that additional monies, it pushes you over their cap. I think that that's a merited argument. I think that charging someone $250 for an estimate and charging them 20% is clearly above 20%. Right. I think that hiring an engineer and paying for an engineer to get the client to file a claim you know, there's a myriad of factors there. It just kind of fits back into the the rules are pretty cut and dry. But at the same time, to give some reverence to Matt's argument, if you haven't been paid yet, you pay the engineer or you take responsibility for it, you still haven't gone above that 20% cap yet because you haven't been paid yet. So, I mean, there's there's some gray areas in there, but it kind of comes down to walks like a duck and talks like a duck. But I can tell yeah. you that if you're investigated on it, the interpretation from the state is going to be very different. And our state acts in good dispatch with those things. And they will be very deep investigations that you spend quite a amount of time answering those questions. So it's just better best practices not to get into it. I can't call you a shot. single claim where I have hired an expert prior to the claim being filed. I think I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah, but George is a crap shoot, so it's totally different. That's true. <laughs> That's true. It's very rare for a public adjuster to get involved in a claim uh, prior to it being filed. But anyway, in most states, in, in Georgia, we've been lucky to have lots of referral sources that do get us involved prior to, but 
it's just not something that I that we do very often is hire any kind of an I can't think of a single one that we've hired an expert for prior to the claim being filed. I, I tell you something for us that's beneficial is we don't work closely with many contractors. So one of the first things an insurance company does is go, how did this EMS guy get out here? And you go, I don't know the client called him. Oh, and then how did this get out of here? And then who, who is it that's, um, is it Zach that says you put the bullets in the gun? <laughs> Eventually the desk examiner is going to fire on one. Like, you know, by having an arm length extension away from all these people and having the ability to say, no, the client did this. You guys told him to do that. Well, who tarped the roof? Um, you guys sent somebody. So that's one that I absolutely love. When we file, the first thing I ask the carrier is, hey, can you send uh, EMS out? And they say, actually, yeah, we can. And then you go, hey, can you put my client in housing because their kitchen's trash? And they go, yes, we can. And then four weeks later, when you're trying to settle the claim and they go, the, the new examiner looks at it and they go, oh my God, this EMS guy put, put nails in the batten strips all over the roof and they destroyed the roof. Can we get their information so we can go after them? And you go, yes, it's your contractor. Here's his card. <laughs> That's happened to us many times, many, many times. So we try to use those things. Pate says that I, I need to start asking you guys a little bit uh, easier questions because I've been killing you guys. And then my wife thinks that this is a really easy question. What is your favorite type of claim to work and why? Insurance claim. <laughs> All right. With that answer, it is an easy question. <laughs> um, I personally like claims that have an immense amount of ambiguity to coverages and that I have to hunt and fight because I have gotten to a point where I like that. So I like dealing with caps that are exhausted different lines of coverages, somebody saying there's no coverage for this. I actually had a carrier recently deny a claim based off of an endorsement for contents, but they cropped it and just said that, and basically said like, we don't cover nothing ever unless it's on a Thursday at 4.15 on the dot. But when we got the policy finally, which you normally don't get until your ninth request, it, it said coverage C. So the, like, I like stuff like that, that's me. What about you, Nick? You know, in terms of choosing a favorite, I'm still fairly early in my litigation career. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting to experience the new challenges and difficulties that come with all sorts of different claims, um, which is why, you know, insurance, uh, the, the insurance world is, is such an interesting, um, you know, area of law to get involved with. Uh, there is no such thing as a straightforward claim or else they wouldn't be uh, coming to you for your assistance. All the coverage issues and different forms and policy interpretation principles and definitions contained in each different policy. Um, it keeps you on your toes. Uh, but I'm going to harp back to what I talked about earlier, which was uh, I'm not really not really concerned with what the primary issue of the, the claim is. I'm more concerned with uh, how well the file has been kept. Do we have all the information we need? Um, and uh, do we have sort of a plan of how to proceed with it? So uh, issues with the, the file and um, the, the, you know, the intake process and all that, that, that's where I get to the point where I'm like, oh, I'm going to enjoy working on this file or I'm not so much this one. So kind of a cop out answer, but that's what I'm giving. It kind of was a very lawyer answer. So, yeah. Kudos. Uh, just, just to answer that question myself, I really like the, the really strange ones. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm very similar to Frank. I want the really tough ones where I can try to flex my PA muscles a little bit and see what happens. Uh, JS Nelson, how often should the insured or PA expect to be updated by the attorney and or appraiser? Why not PA as well? I think the PA should be every 14 days because that's a reasonable period of time as established by the state of Florida. And in my opinion, I look for the attorneys to reach out to the clients on marker dates. And that's normally two, four, six weeks. And then at that point, every 30 days thereafter. Do you think attorneys should give the same amount of updates? I just look for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks in the state of Florida. If you're not talking to settlement inside of six weeks, you're probably going to be in that seat for a little while and after that every 30 days i think is reasonable but that's just that's just me i second that and i would also include every time they call you oh yeah yeah well, that's an obvious that's 
No, no you, you say it's obvious, but that's, uh, that's yeah. the first one. I just like blowing people off when they give me a cause. Like, I don't know. Bye. Couldn't just hang up. Sometimes up. the most obvious ones are the most important ones. So, yes, when they call you, that's when they should be updated. Matt, okay. that's a total lie. You like to hear yourself talk. That's true. I just think it's a hard one because while they're appraising, they really shouldn't be talking too much to either party ish. You know, like that's a hard one. I think at that point, if there was a PA on the file, maybe written communication between appraisers only because the panel can go sideways real quick. I think the appraisal question part of that is, is, is a better question. So, can the appraisers who are supposed to be independent and disinterested and all that, can they give updates to the insured and how detailed should those updates be? I've had appraisals where I have discussed that I wanted to speak with the client. I told the opposing appraiser, I need to speak with the client. And he threatened to write a letter to have me thrown off panel for that. And I half ass agree with him. Like I, I, I was just letting him know before executing, I was going to decide if I wanted to sign or not sign. And um, it's, I think appraisal should be immensely disinterested, mm -hmm. but I don't think that being a PA on a file, it makes you not disinterested as an appraiser. If your fees aren't increasing, I don't think it makes a hell of a difference. So I did one where I abolished my PA contract and did it for free just to prove a point against a specific insurance company that loves to say you're non disinterested, even though they use the same appraisers on every single file. But I mean, if you that's a good point. I mean, if you're a, if you're a public adjuster and your job is to look out for the best interests of the insured, then you are looking out for their interests, not yours. You're not disinterested in their interest. It, it uses the word interest in both cases. Mm -hmm. So if you're a public adjuster for the claim, then you're definitely, I don't think you're disinterested regardless of how your fees actually work. Even if you're getting paid hourly or a flat rate, you'd still be technically interested because you're looking out for the interests of the insured. But just because the insured hires you doesn't, and it's an appraisal, doesn't mean that you can't give them updates. If you're giving them information factual on what's going on, that's not, there's no conflict of interest there. You're not trying to ask them their opinion on anything. But if it's in writing, no one can make that allegation. That's true. There's plenty of appraisers that uh, have gotten involved in my claims that have told me how horrible the opposing appraiser is in talking to the adjuster and the adjuster is telling him that they can or cannot prove something. And clearly that's a problem. And then in the exact same conversation they'll ask me if i'm okay with it ending at a certain price i'm like you just told me that they said that and that's a problem but you, you can't and ask me the bottom line calling a spade a spade same thing if you're getting paid from the insurer or the insured there's no scenario you're ever genuinely disinterested not really and that that's true from the carrier side too you know if, if the no, carrier is hiring the same person over and over again then you're worried about your job so you want to do a good job for it that's kind of the issue that engineers have. It's not that they're going out of their way to write a fraudulent report. They're just going out of their way to write a report that satisfies their clients. So they get additional work. Yep. Puts them in a pickle. Nick agrees. I can tell. He does yeah. just smile. I was just, uh, I was just looking in terms of while you guys were discussing the disinterested appraiser issue. And, uh, like I said earlier there, we write blogs on these types of things all the time. And I mean, I could, I could read you the particular case that chip Merlin actually updated a blog on, on in February of 2020, but I won't do so. I, I will just say, yes. Um, if you're a public adjuster and you're entitled to any sort of compensation, is that, that the one where they define mm -hmm. what disinterested yeah. means? I've used that language. They say it's uh it's unambiguous in the the policy language. I, I've used that specific language from that case to ask engineers if they are going to act in a biased fashion in some way, and it, it's helped me out quite a bit. Uh, Nick, how detailed do you feel an attorney update to a contractor should be to a contractor or client? Just a contractor. Ooh, contractor or client. Let's, let's go with contractor. It depends on what uh, state of the proceedings you're in. If you're at the initial litigation or you're just initiating litigation, I mean, the, the, the update should be sort of a 
uh, comprehensive uh, strategic plan, what, what to expect, what the options are. If they do this, this is what we're probably going to do. You, what you should, you should expect in terms of a, a timeline or are we seeking for an early resolution? When do we expect mediation to be? Are we looking at an eight to 10 month uh, mediation plan? And uh, basically just explaining what the client's uh, role in litigation is going to be. So that's, I mean, all those things need to be considered in, in the initiation. Uh, phase. Uh, w once you get to, you know, long, when you're in discovery or whenever you've realized that there is not, not going to be any early resolution, so you're actually moving forward, uh, the, each in particular update should just be, this is where we were when we left off. This is where we're going to be in the, net, in, in the near future. Here's the big milestones and or events that are going to occur in the near future. And uh, this is what the potential outcomes of those could be. And each individual time you're contacted, you should have that sort of update uh, at the ready. But um, other than that, there's so many different possible areas you could be in litigation that as long as you have it, at the very least what the next major event is and what the, the prior event was and what effect that had on your case, that should be uh, the focus of any update during the claim. If when you have a, a client attorney contract signed, it's kind of an agreement, and then you have a client attorney privilege, how much permission from your client do you have to get in order to give those kinds of updates to a contractor or a PA? Um, you should always err on informing uh, the client exactly what information has been requested in regard to their claim. Um, and that's where I'm going to leave that. Uh, if, if you're going to be giving out client details or information, you talk to the client first. Yeah. I don't give softball questions, softball questions. All right. I'll that one. Wrap this up soon. Do <laughs> I guess, do you recommend DOA SOU suit statute of on the on you? SOU? I don't know what SOU is. Uh, direction of umpire, selection of uh, director of appraiser, and selection of umpire. That's what it is. At the onset of appraisal, before appraisal gets contentious. Do you oh, recommend doing that? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is so loaded. <laughs> I have appraisers all the time. They're like, hey, let's just go out there and appraise. If we get to impasse, man, we'll pick, you know, we'll pick one of them impers. Like, no, 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 no. You no. got to pick that umpire up front. The, the whole appraisal is dictated by who the umpire is. Yeah. <laughs> That's egregious. I mean, everything should be signed lock, stock, and barrel before you even exchange a ESX file or a folder or anything. Yeah. Uh, good question. Good, good question. I know we're going to impasse, but, you know, we'll just figure it out when we get there. Carrier ain't going to let me pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> they do that a lot. All right, another appraisal question for the hell of it. In appraisal, I don't believe the insurer's rights and the insureds are created equal. The insured knows about their property and what will make it as it was. The insurer only has a financial bias. And exposure. Yep. I mean, I hate to defend the other side, but, you know, they got financial exposure. It's a good point, though. What's really funny is that this, this guy, Josh Friedman, is on YouTube with this comment. But he was also on Facebook earlier. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he went to YouTube to try to hide who he was. He's everywhere. Here he was earlier. Savoir Fair. Facebook. Damn good thing. He says. wouldn't be able to tell who he was if he was on YouTube. That would be pretty funny if that's the case. Because we can totally see who you are, Josh. Josh, you are Friedman. We know who you are. Anyway. All right. So if, if you were wanting to go into Florida, do you recommend joining FAPIA as a PA? I do, especially if you're new to the state. They have a, a plethora of good documents and information, and uh, they're very helpful. I would recommend reaching out to a PA in the area and going and, you know, shadowing some claims with them and uh, work some claims with them, get familiar with the lay of the land. I think the average person coming into the state of Florida would be shocked at about 95% of the PAs they call first ring would be like, yeah, if you want to come down and run some claims with me, by all means, come on down. I'll show you what I know. As long as you're licensed and, you know, or in training or something along those lines that allows it, why not, man? Why not help people out? Teach a man to fish. Is there another source yeah. of finding other PAs that might be a mentor-like role for someone trying to get into Florida? 
I recommend checking this uh, podcast. Listen to this bull. There's a pretty good resource. And uh, no, I mean, get on Facebook and, and reach out to people. I don't know of any other organizations. I'm sure certainly some exist. Um, so if they wanted to reach out to you and ask you a crap ton of questions, you'd be okay with that? Yeah, or apparently Mike and his firm's up in the panhandle. So. About Mike, I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah 100%. Anyone has any questions, by all means, reach out. Um, my cell phone number is plastered all over God's green earth. Call me. Cool. Nick, do you want to put your cell phone all over God's green earth? Yeah, why not? Why not? We should just post it right here on this video. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> That's good marketing, right? good marketing. Right. <laughs> no, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, kind of like our, if you're interested in us, uh, you know, getting a consultation or anything like that, Merlin Law Group, we have our website. You can contact us anytime. Frank, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. You ever worked with Merlin? No. Jet? No. You I have, I I have like, yeah, I've worked with him. <laughs> Working on it all the time. <laughs> I have reached out to Merlin Law Firm a handful of times, and um, Did I say for that? whatever reason, the stars have not been aligned. They've never been anything but helpful and accommodating when I've called. I know um, they're darn good attorneys, and I look forward to working with them someday. Well, I appreciate your time, guys. I think we got a lot of good information out there. There's definitely a very uh, different set of rules when going into Florida. So I appreciate you guys answering those questions. Uh, Final comments. Is there any other advice you'd want to give to somebody if they wanted to start working as a PA in Florida? Frank? Um, seriously, just call and come down. Um, if you're going to switch careers, you're going to switch locations. Each one of those is so open ended. But if someone's genuinely moving to Florida, come down. I'm not going to beg anyone to come work here or force them or, you know, come down, spend a little time, you know. Can they stay with you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Some advice on how to be a better attorney in Florida. It's talk to PAs. Uh, I've learned a lot in this conversation. Uh, so uh, I appreciate you having me and uh, letting me listen. At least try to attempt some questions that you may have. And like I said, uh, talk to PAs, talk to everyone in the business. You know, you learn a lot just by having conversations like these and uh, expanding your knowledge in this uh, particular area. So I appreciate it. I agree. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I'm going to take you off real quick. You can stay in the wings if you'd like to. Uh, that is the end of today's broadcast. Next week, we have John Wood. John Wood. If you know who John Wood is, he's probably the most brilliant man I've ever actually talked to. He, he got accepted into the Mensa Society. And uh, he has a, a really cool Dragon Slayer logo for a line of clothing. I was going to ask him about that. But we're going to be talking about... Uh, AAA, the American Adjuster Association, that he is one of, I think he's the vice president of the organization, and getting into all things that pertain to that organization and their mission. So that's next week, Tuesday at four o'clock Eastern time. If you join us live, you get to ask questions live. If you watch this after the fact, you can still ask questions, and I'm sure that uh, the members that are on the here will still answer them. Uh, but it's always nice to get that question answered live. So please join us live if you can. Otherwise, post the questions even after the fact. That's fine. And we'll see you next Tuesday. You guys have a good one.